Hello and welcome to the Churros y Tacticas podcast. It is Tuesday, May 30th, 2.15 p.m. Eastern, 8.15 p.m. in Europe. And we are deviating from the norm of the regular Keon and Diego podcast to once a year get our heads out of our Real Madrid and Barcelona asses to talk about the rest of Spain. And this happens like once a year or so. And today we are going to talk about Atlético. And to do that, we are bringing in from Into the Calderon and also currently at Marca, Jeremy Barron. Jeremy has been on the show before on Churros y Tacticas. And for those of you who also listen to Man and Jumadur, he's also there at least once or twice a year. So, Jeremy, welcome to the show, man. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing great, man. Great to be here. Always love chatting with you. And uh, yeah, looking forward to it. Awesome. Part two, Diego solo session. That's coming up. You can stick around for that. That's on this episode. Um, we're going to talk about Atletico, but right on brand for this podcast, a lot of Real Madrid fans are wondering about one specific player who's under contract at Atletico Madrid. That is Jao Felix. So we are going to find a way to turn this back and talk about Real Madrid by talking about Jao Felix. So I actually want to start there, Jeremy. So the news broke today. Um, before we started recording, Cereso said, Atletico's president, Cereso, um, said that they have been informed by Chelsea and Pochettino, who's there now, that they're not really interested in João Felix, who will now be returning to Atletico Madrid. And correct me if I'm wrong, Jeremy, but the tone of the press conference was kind of like, uh, yeah, unfortunately, uh, João Felix has come back and the guys we were hoping wanted him don't want him. So he's coming back. Sorry, guys. Was that the, the correct interpretation of what was happening? More or less, yeah. Uh, the club certainly knew this was a possibility when they agreed to the loan with Chelsea back in mid-January. They knew that they were opening themselves up for this possibility to occur, given that there was no option or obligation to buy in the agreement with Chelsea to send Joao there. Now it's come to pass, and it's going to create a, a very interesting uh, culebron over the summer uh, a very interesting soap opera and saga as to where is Joao Felix going to go next. Does he have chances to stay in Atletico? Is he going to go back to England? Could he go back to Portugal and play at Benfica? I think a lot of different options are on the table now that uh, the club has been informed that uh, Pochettino doesn't want him at Chelsea. Are you completely ruling the idea out that he could play for Atletico next season? No, nah, I don't think you can rule it out at all. I think the chances are fairly slim, given how poor his relationship is with Cholo Simeone, but I don't think we can rule it out. Uh, certainly not at this club, where, where stranger things have happened uh, in terms of transfers. It seems unlikely, but you never know. Uh, there would have to be a serious mending of, of that relationship, uh, but we'll see. So um, I think it's interesting to talk about where Zhao Felix is as a footballer right now. But I thought we could backtrack a little bit and start from the beginning because Atletico paid a lot of money from him for him from Benfica. Fully knowing what kind of player he is, what his strengths are, what are his weaknesses, the sample size, the six-month sample size or so uh, where he blitzed the Europa League that year. Atletico are so good at scouting the right players to fit their system. What do you think that they got wrong with this from a scouting standpoint? Do you, do you think that they felt like Zhao Felix could buy into their system, but that it was as simple as he couldn't do so? Or did they just really mistake um, the profile that they were signing? Did they just get that part wrong? I think they got the profile wrong for the most part. Well, um, signing Zhao Felix uh, remains the biggest bet clubs ever made in terms of transfers. 126 million euro going back to Benfica over the period of that seven year contract, which they signed him. Um, and they were willing to be patient with Joao and let him find his way and let him adapt to Simeone and let Simeone adapt to him. But from the beginning, you kind of got the sense, Kian, that Joao and Cholo weren't going to quite see eye to eye. He's not at all a Chelsea type player. He's not, the, and this isn't to denigrate him, but he's not the kind of player who's going to give his all for the collective, who's not going to sacrifice the individual. Uh, for the greater good of the team um, and that's not a knock on him that's just that's his personality and his attitude as a player and under Diego Simeone that's that's not the winning way to play I think the club wanted to make this big bet in order to 
I have another Ballon d'Or contender in their team after Antoine Griezmann left to join Barcelona. Uh, they wanted to have another star in La Liga who didn't play for Real Madrid, who didn't play for FC Barcelona. And that was most of the thinking was not whether he was going to be a perfect seamless fit under Simeone, but this kid's going to be a star. Uh, we can't miss this opportunity to sign him. If we wait another year, he will no longer be available. Madrid will come after him. Man City will come after him. Bayern Munich will come after him. So yeah, I think if Atletico were given the chance to do it again, they probably would. Um, because th this is the kind of gamble that you have to take eventually at, at some point as a top team to remain relevant. It's a major credit to Simeone um, and the club as well that they have continued to remain relevant and at an elite level, even though Joao has been a pretty big miss. You look at kind of um, the players who have succeeded at, at Atletico and not elsewhere. And then there's a the flip side, the players who don't see, succeed at Atletico and succeed elsewhere. And I'm thinking of players like Rodri, for example, who was a really, really awesome player for Villarreal, went to Atletico, still an awesome player, but perhaps the fact that he wasn't constantly on the ball and building plays from the back in, in that system and was more defensively oriented didn't necessarily get the best out of him. And then he goes to City and has been incredible uh, there in that single pivot role. Really, really perfect for what Pep wants to do. Is it possible that Jao Felix is of that ilk where you put him in a different style, he will succeed? I mean, I think he didn't, he didn't do well at Chelsea. He got crucified because I remember like against Real Madrid, he had that like breakaway chance where he that he missed or I think he was closed down. He was obviously like too slow and he couldn't finish that chance. But also like if, hey, like if your only person who can score a goal is Jao Felix, you're in trouble and that's Chelsea. So I like, you look at the entire collective Chelsea mess and the fact that, that the whole thing was just a burning ship that was had no sporting vision you have to have, at least be forgiving of Zhao Felix to be put in there and not succeeding, I think. Um, but is, do you think that you put him in a different system? And if so, what is that system? Like, that would that would let him thrive. Yeah, it, it's kind of hard to say now. Um, and I wrote about this on Into the Calderon a few weeks ago, that Chelsea had severe institutional dysfunction, and that is not a reflection on Joao Felix. He himself is not responsible for it he got sucked into this because Chelsea's ownership, frankly, has no idea what they're doing. Uh, and I don't really think that's going to change under Pochettino. Um, but Chelsea didn't really need to sign Joao Felix. They didn't really need to have him. Uh, they needed a different profile of forward than Joao is. Um, but in, in some respects, um, this kind of was a, a good opportunity, a good showcase for him uh, with Chelsea kind of in the middle of the Premier League, not close at all to the European places kind of go for broke, do whatever. Um, the managerial, co the coaching carousel didn't help him either. Um, but Graham Potter and Frank Lampard both tried to give him a freer role behind a forward, um, more or less a, as a classic number 10. But the problem for Joao is that position doesn't really work anymore. When I watch Man City play, you spoke about Rodri. When I watch City play, um, the number of goals they score isn't the thing that, that impresses me the most. Uh, it's how hard they work. It's their teamwork. It's their work ethic. Their physical level is absolutely insane. Um, and Joao Felix isn't at that level. The best teams currently, the best clubs currently playing in Europe um, have astounding physical levels and they work extremely well as a collective. And Joao Felix wants a role that has been phased out of the game over the last 10 years, a free roaming role with very little defensive responsibility. He just gets to cherry pick and play close to goal. And the best teams now don't they don't they can't afford that they can't afford to collapse like that and to sacrifice their structural integrity to suit the whims of this one player um and i think there are still teams that will do that for joao felix if they want him badly enough but they're not at a low level um he he routinely speaks about how much he's enjoying playing in england and how much he wants to play in the champions league next year those kinds of clubs are not going to make bids for him based on how he did at Chelsea. And that's not entirely his fault, but that is the kind of brutal reality for him. Yeah, I think I think that's really interesting to note too. And I think with Zhao Felix, 
trying to figure out where his best position is, is kind of difficult to do. And I always feel like when a player is in that kind of limbo, it's hard to know like whether you should take a gamble on him or not. Just to link this back to Real Madrid for a second here, as I love doing. <laughs> People are like, well, can he be a Benzema replacement? Well, like my answer to that is generally no, because he's not a Benzema type profile necessarily, although he is in some respect because he can do all the link up stuff stuff. He's a tremendous support forward. Um, he's someone like if you put it right behind the striker, which Benzema can do, can do really well. Is he going to be able to score goals like Benzema can? He doesn't have that side of it, uh, which kind of puts him in the Rodrigo role, where Real Madrid have that. The player who can play as an attacking midfielder, the occasional false nine, do a lot of link-up stuff, but Rodrigo can also score reliably. Um, and I think that's what Jao Felix is kind of missing to play that role. And I guess my that's kind of my answer to this. Is it worth paying someone like Jao Felix potentially could take away from the Rodrigo profile also, where do you put him? Um, you put him on the left wing. That's a no-go because Vinicius is there. You're going to put him in uh, as the third attacker or, or your main goal scorer. You can't put him as your main goal scorer. You can't, can't put him as a third attacker. I suppose you could, um, but what does that mean for Rodrigo? I'm not, I, I'm not saying he would be a bad signing, but these are just all the things that you would have to consider if you're Real Madrid. I also don't know if there's a way in how Ch- Atletico would even entertain the idea of selling yeah. him to Real Madrid. There's also that aspect of it. What do you think? Would that that is that would they look at trying to send him outside of Spain uh if it, it came down to that? That's the priority that they would want to keep him in England or they would maybe Benfica will be interested in bringing him back on loan. That'd be a sweet deal for Benfica because we're still paying them for the initial transfer four years ago and they'll get to keep the player on loan. Uh Benfica should be all over that if it comes to that. Um But reports have said today that there are currently no offers on the table for Joao. um, And that kind of suits the the player that he is right now. There's no real defined fixed position for him. I've said for the past year or so that um, the way he strikes the ball, with how good his technique is, that he could be a nine. He could be a center forward, but he just simply isn't strong enough. He's he simply isn't physical enough. It demands too much force and work than he has committed to as a as a player over the past four years um he would love to play in that classic number 10 role uh someone like james or kaka used to play but like that guy isn't really around anymore there's a reason james rodriguez has been drifting around uh the globe for the last few years is because that kind of player has been phased out of the modern game at an elite level uh and i i don't know where he really fit i guess it would depend on the individual context of, of any interested club well, I, that player profile, I think, really doesn't exist if you're a limited number 10. If you can do, if you can morph yourself into the Bernardo Silva or David Silva, yeah. where you're a little bit more multifunctional, versatile, you work really hard as a presser and, and you, you, you're you just really, really great at so many things. Like you can make it work. Or Odegaard is another example of someone who has been able to make a living out of it. Um, but I do think uh, with Jao Felix, I think... Your point about goal scoring is interesting because he can strike the ball. And I think, I, I suppose it comes down to this. Is he your main goal scorer or is he someone that if he gives you goals, it's a bonus? If he's your main goal scorer, I think that's a problem. Uh, yeah. But if he's someone like as your second or third option in attack, like if you're just looking at the numbers now, he generates a ton of shots, by the way. This year, he's actually uh, seventh in the top five leagues in shots per 90. He will um, shoot. <laughs> yeah, he he will shoot. If you compare him to attacking midfielders and the wingers, he's in the 84th percentile in, in goal scoring. And if you compare him with forwards, in the he's in the 50th percentile. So it really depends on where you put him. Um, So, yeah, Jeremy, I, I hate to cut this short, but I actually have to deal with something now and I have to go. Um, which is kind of unexpected that and my, my kids are here now. So I'm going to say thank you for the very brief cameo. Um, we got to have you on the summer again. I also know you're extremely busy with, with your new gig at Marca. So uh, wish you all the best, buddy. It was great chatting. Thank you for the insight and uh, all the best, man. Everyone should go read Jeremy Suffolk into the Calderon too. If you like analysis on Atletico, love, you'll love Jeremy's work. Do that. Jeremy, thanks, buddy. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kia. Great to talk with you. 
We're live, baby, baby. What is good, churritos? It is Monday, the 29th of May. We are here with another churros for all our loyal listeners, for everybody, not just patrons. No, sir. We're out to the public today, boy. And we got a bunch of topics that I want to get through and discuss with you. Yes, I'm hoping to get a little bit of crowd participation. Why not? It is churros. It's the beginning of the week. So let's get down dirty, shall we? Let's talk a little something. What's this over here? Let me press this button. Well, it's definitely not that. In fact, what it is, it is Monday the 29th, I believe it is. The 29th of May. Is it the 29th of May? Yes, it's the 29th of May. And um, a shout out to everybody that is over in Kian's region of the world, Nova Scotia, if I'm uh, not mistaken, they are experiencing serious forest fires. And uh, it is the reason why Kian isn't here today. He will, uh, he had to be evacuated, him and his family, they are safe. I don't know if he's mentioned this on uh, his Managing Madrid podcast, because he, in the meantime, he did, <laughs> check this out. So they got told to evacuate and to only take their prize possess their most ne the necessities the most necessary of possessions wifey is packing the bags with diapers essential clothing kian is pack upstairs packing his podcast equipment that's called commitment to the pod uh that being said they did have today off so he is out with the uh the kids are not in school so he was out um I couldn't attend to the podcast, seeing as he thought that I was not a, un, that I would be unable to make it. I will not be able to make Fridays the Patreons podcast, but I said I was going to make uh, would be able to make this one. So miscommunication, all good, nothing to worry about whatsoever. Uh, instead, what we said was, uh, why don't I start some topics, and then maybe he can finish the topics, or just do a part two. He might invite our friend, Ewan, Jeremy, somebody onto the podcast. Why not a Colchonero to talk uh, a few other things? And in the meantime, I also wanted to get through a bunch of topic, topics with you guys. For those of you watching the replay, you see the titles. You see it correctly. It does say, hasta luego, come no. And it does say, in fact, I want to change this title right here. Goodbye, old friend. No, no it's not a goodbye. It's un... It's un Hasta luego, amigo. Because, uh, yes, yesterday in the Spotify come no, Barca played their very final game um, in what is the come no as we know it. The renovation, the restructuring of the entire stadium and the entire uh, area, you should say as well. I mean, the entire block, the whole neighborhood will change. This uh, Les Corts will not no longer be what we know it to be because um, that's it for the next year and a half at least until November of 2024. Barca will play in Montjuic in the Estadio Luis Compañes, the Estadio Olympic, the Olympic Stadium that is so beautifully placed on the Montjuic Mountain. Uh, has a beautiful view, I believe this capacity was 60,000, so uh, we have to take a bit of a hit there and make. A stadium that is not our home, in fact, was the home of the now new team, new addition to the second division, Espanol. It was once their home before they moved to uh, the RCDE Stadium in El Prat. Um, the Olympic Stadium, of course, where the inauguration, the 92 Olympics were held. So uh, I wanted to uh, discuss a few things. The laying of the brick, the symbolic laying of a brick. <laughs> and I always get funny images in my head when I say, I lay a brick. I've had a bunch of Scottish South African friends that use that expression to take a dos, dump, to dump, to do number dos. El numerito dos, sabes? You know, the number two. Uh, they say, I've got a lay a brick, or something along those lines, anyway. And um, so the laying of the brick, 
you know, is also symbolic, of course, of placing the first stone or, you know, poner la, la primera piedra. Um, it was a time capsule. All of the representatives, club representatives or representatives of different sections. You had two players from the youth teams, boy and, boys and girls youth teams. You had uh, Melanie Serrano of the women's team, Busi for the men's, head coach Chavi, Presi, um, Asensi, the, the president of the Player Association, were all there to symbolically place of objects of value, of, 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 of yeah, symbol, uh, to, uh, of symbol, like that the were symbolism, that had symbolism in them, objects of symbolism. Classic. Uh, place them in the box. And this box was buried uh, pitch side of the Camp Nou as, uh, again, a symbolic gesture of it being the first brick being laid. Uh, that will be El No Camp Nou. El No Spotify Camp Nou. El No Spotify Camp Nou. I guess maybe there will be a change of name as well. That will hopefully happen as in the inauguration of the No Come No on November of 2024, where it should hopefully coincide with the 125th anniversary of our beloved club, Football Club Barcelona. And uh, we'll be able to play a fantastic inauguration game around December when the exact date will fall and to welcome the new era. Yesterday was the old era, the closing of a certainly very beautiful era, illustrious era, a uh, successful era. There were eight shirts that came out uh, in representation of the uh, successful eras that Barca uh, has enjoyed playing in the Camp Nou. Uh, I'm trying to see if I can find it. it was, uh, I remember seeing 92, of course, the Johan Cruyff Dream Team 09. Uh, uh, 15, 2015, 74, it was better. 92, 09, 2015, 74, the arrival of Greif, um, getting four of the last, yeah. well, th this year, I believe it was 2022. Let me just look it up. Going out of blank here. Uh, here it is, here it is. I took a picture. This is very blurry. I can't see. Hold on. Okay, let, let, let me do this chronologically. 57, inauguration of the Camp Nou, of course. 68, 74, 05, 85, uh, 92, 09, 2015, and 2022. Correct. So... Um, all representing different eras, beautiful eras, or, or that had meaning, that had value to the making the, 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 the history of Barça, but certainly also the history of the, the Camp Nou. And um, they did the, the, Sard uh, the Sardinias, right? The, the, the folklore dancing of the uh, Catalan culture. They had a dance that you see as well sort of take place when Barça win the title. They make the big... A circle and they run around in a circle and they do the dance and of course it was the goodbye as well of the team captains Sergio Busquets highly successful player in case you didn't know let me tell you about the Sergio Busquets guy he was very good changed the game uh, the holding midfield hasn't been the same since he's the best and Jordi Alba as well, very successful, arguably the best left back in the history of Football Club Barcelona. Uh, oh, let's go with Sergi Barjuan. Barjuan. No, Barjuan is uh, certainly up there. I don't know. You know, I, this is not the podcast where I'm going to get into whether it's Barjuan, whether it's Alba, whether it's whoever it might be, Erika Vidal. There's a, there's a case to be made there. Okay. Oh, Jesus. Um... And uh, fireworks, the whole nine. Finish on a high, baby. The club managed to finish on a high, what has been a very difficult season. Of course, needed to get back to winning ways as well. Did so, you know, in, in very good fashion against Mallorca, who had nothing to, to play for, to be quite frank. But, uh, you know, 
uh, Aguirre has been uh, handling business. Um, why is the mic not holding? And um, we saw Ansu Fati score two goals. So do I need to talk about this? It's been in the press or it's been leaked. It's been rumored by a certain journalist that is uh, apparently close to Xavi that the five names of the players that Xavi is not counting on will already... I, I'm going to put the, camera, the, the view here, otherwise I'm never looking into the camera. I want to look you in the eye, not at myself. I have a tendency to... We all have a tendency to just kind of shift our focus to us. I want to focus... Look at you guys. And uh, so the five players that... Chavi will say a bit farewell to her, will basically say, thanks for your services, buddy. You're a good guy and all, but either these are the needs, necessities of the club, and, you know, for me, it's okay if uh, we move on and uh, take different paths. Those are, should I name them? I guess I should name them, if I can remember. Well, some won't be much of a, a mystery. Frank Essier is one that is being, whose name is being put out there. The reason being, Xavi's very happy. Again, this is all reporting to this journalist, and, and maybe I should, uh, it would be good of me to name him as well. And I will get to doing my job as a uh, responsible journalist by naming the sources, uh, at least those sources that are claiming to be other sources that are close to sources, who source the sources, sourceify, seeing flying sources. Hence the alien part of this podcast. No, but uh, uh, it was from La Copa, if I'm not mistaken. I, I, you know, bear with me is all I can always ask for these podcasts where time is of the essence. I cannot waste a lot of time when it's cold outside. Let me just get to it in a minute, okay? The names are Frank Essier. The reason being, according to this journalist, is because money, money necessities. Um, the club are in need to continue to lower the salary cap. And the Frank Essier is a player that came on for free. Therefore, it might be an, simply out of, again, necessity that Barca are willing to entertain slash accept an offer for the uh, now holding the defensive mid of Barca, Frank Essien. Okay, moving on. The other player that reportedly is uh, up on the chopping blocks, so to speak, is Pablo Torre. However, according to the journalist, it would be a una cesión, a loan, and um, is a player, again, that also, uh, you know, right, well, well, right now, in the case of Pablo Torre, the market value would probably be not hugely significant. Uh, the club still believe in that he is a prospect, a future prospect, and um, they would see it with good eyes, uh, as I translate badly once again, from Spanish directly into English, a transfer, a, uh, a loan rather, a loan spell of this player to another team that would, where he would get more minutes and, and yada, yada, yada. We know all these uh, kinds of stories. Uh, so we'll have to wait and see whether that would happen. Next one is Pablo Torres, uh, excuse me, Ferran Torres. Uh, Ferran Torres, again, a player that uh, came, yes, with we could say a hefty fee, right? And Barca had to um, pay reportedly, a, it was around the 55 million mark, if I'm not entirely mistaken. Um, so the fact that this is a player that has a market value, as in like certainly has certain, uh, could have certain people interested in him, uh, the primary, uh, you know, target market for this player would be the Premier League, a Premier League that enjoys, you know, uh, having healthy budgets, let's say, uh, a, a, a league as well where Ferran, uh, Ferran Torres, yes, is uh, 
experienced in, yeah, of course, with Manchester City. You know, despite what people say, and, you know, people point out, well, he was on the bench for Pep Guardiola, obviously, I mean, he had a lot of competition as well with top quality players in front of him. Uh, you know, it was hard for him to break out there. Despite all that, his numbers were good, statistically speaking. Uh, goals to minutes ratio, goals to shot ratio. Uh, it's all these things were 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 very good there. So he could have some uh, suitors. He could have some. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if he has you know uh, sort of mid tier table table teams in the Premier League, upper tier, mid upper tier table teams that are interested in him. Javi Miguel, okay, Javi Miguel, the journalist uh, reporting for Diario Diario As is the journalist that put this out there. And uh, there, I've named the source. I can now focus once again on you, the audience. What a terrific audience. What a terrific audience. Right now, I believe one person is watching. We are live, folks. We are live on Dspot, the trusted channel, before posting the audio of this on the channels where you normally listen to this, pod, uh, to this podcast, the Spotify's, the Apple's, yeah, yeah, yeah. But this spot is where it all began, and that's where I'm streaming from live. Make yourself heard, one watcher. Uh, don't be shy. Why don't you fire off a question if you have any, and I will try to figure out <laughs> where I can read that. In the meantime, let me continue. Uh, I've named four. Frank Esien, Pablo Torre, Ferran Torres. Three, I've named. The fourth one, the one that hurts the most, Ansu Fati. Ansu Fati is apparently one of these players that could potentially leave the club if the offer is right. A player that, of course, comes from La Masia, the number 10. The player that we all hold so dear to our hearts. A uh, player we certainly don't want to see go. I say we because I believe I speak for the majority in that I don't want to see Ansu go and it's going to pay me if and when he does. Uh, was there a sense of melancholy, uh, a sense of, 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 of emotion, sadness perhaps as uh, Ansu Fati got back to score in a brace against Mallorca as he was looking to the stands uh, with this sort of reminiscent look of you know, mm, what once was and what no longer is and might never be again. Was it Ansu's last game when the, in a Barca shirt at the Camp No? Uh, I don't know. That is what Javi Miguel of Us is saying. I hope not. I hope that Javi Miguel uh, mm, is wrong on this one. Uh, considering that, again, reportedly he is close to Xavi, uh, it, it would seem odd to me that Xavi uh, leaks this to a Javi Miguel and says, you know, go ahead, uh, have a field day with this. And I don't mind if you put these players out on blast on your social media account. But, um, you know, I don't know, man. I don't know. I, 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 I tr don't even really want to entertain it. I, I don't want to think about it. Um... Let's hope it's not true. Could I see it happen? Yes. You know, I can see it happen. Again, it's a player that, of course, cost the club nothing in the sense that he's from La Masia. Um, very young. Still has several years left on his contract. Still until 2027, I believe he was the player that renewed the longest. Might be 26. Uh, 2026, I'm not entirely sure. Massive buyout clause. So, and very, uh, I would believe... I would like to believe a lot of suitors, a lot of clubs that would fancy the services of a, a very young and, uh, in my opinion, very capable and talented uh, Ansu Fati that would uh, murder on the wing, on the left wing. So, even as a striker, I mean, I, I just hope he stays. Could I see him go? Yes. For how much, man? It would have to be a nice, nice little sum of money, right? It would have to be a very hefty sum and a decent sum to uh, take our Ansu away from us. We'll see if it happens. Uh, I might be missing out on a player. I don't really know. Um, 
There were five being reported. I can only remember four. Churros! What, ha- what else happened on... Uh, yeah, oh, dude, the Balde injury. Thank goodness it's torn ligaments in his ankle. I say thank goodness because... That was a nasty one. That was a nasty one. Uh, he's uh, going to be out for six, seven weeks. I'm hopeful then... I believe that also that, that, that it completely rules him out for the Nations League. I don't want the boy to play any tournaments. Put it on ice. Chill out by the pool, the beach. Do what you got to do. Nurse. Save that energy. Nurse that injury. And do it right. And come back for what's going to be a crazy, crazy difficult season next season. So, um, Balde, the bad news of what was otherwise a very emotional night and, and successful night, a good night, a, go- a historic night at, at the, uh, the Spotify come no. Uh, with this, I kind of want to close the Barca topic. How long have I been going here? Because uh, I have a little surprise in store. Uh, I, I don't necessarily expect everybody to stick around. I, the reason I say that is because I want to go a little bit off topic. Um, you know, the season is, season is winding down. So is my interest in uh, football a little bit, or this season, let's say. Uh, you know, could I talk about Espanol going down? Sure. I thought they got hard done by, if I'm really being honest, in that game against Valencia, that disallowed goal should have definitely stood. And with that, they've, you know, had some bad, bad decisions go their way. Also, having said that, you know, Pericos cannot com- complain too much because they did try to uh, murder or at least severely injure 23 players and the coaching staff a couple of weeks ago when, oh, who was it? Oh, yeah, uh, Barca, we came and played and became champions over in El Prat, and they j- jumped the fences, ch- charged us, uh, literally chased us out the stadium. So, and they did, without any ramification. So, uh, for them to complain, you know, that, that La Liga has something against them or anything of the sorts is a little bit comical or laughable to me. Yes, they definitely got bad decisions this time around, but, uh, you know, they should have also severed other uh, punishments, say, or ramifications of other actions. And, and quite frankly, I mean, this season, after already having gotten the taste of the second division just a couple of seasons ago, to now climb out of it and fall back down directly again, it seems like the uh, good people at Espanol, led by, um, oy, what's his, the owner's name again? I forgot. Uh, and I, I, in the interest of not making any, you know, potentially offensive remarks, uh, you know, by, by pronouncing last names wrong, I'm just going to plead ignorance on this one and say I forgot. But uh, the now I'm losing my train of thought. Anyway, yeah. So it, it, uh, what I'm trying, what I was trying to say is that they 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 need to do some. A practice a little bit of self-criticism, I would say, and try to learn from past mistakes and do things better moving forward. I understand that is easily said in this somewhat comfortable chair, then done. What did I want to talk about? Bayern becoming <laughs> champions of the Bundesliga once again? A oh, God, Dortmund. God, I really was rooting for you guys as well. All you needed was a win. No, I don't want to talk about that. Do I want to talk about Barca Athletic beating Logroñez and advancing to the playoffs? Clásico inside the baby. We're going to have a two mini Clásico. That's going to be fun in the, uh, in the fight for promotion to the second division. Uh, Barca Athletic will face Castilla Real Madrid in what should be a very two legged uh, knockout round where I think in the case of Barca we face El Dense. We then go head to head between El Dense and Celta de Vigo B. Uh, if we manage to beat Castilla, which I, I understand is a tough ask, Kian cannot rave enough about it. So I'm, I'm hopeful for Rafa Marquez's side. Let's see. It will be very fun, of course, if this side, uh, this Barça Athletic side led by Rafa Marquez, would make it to the second division. And what better way than to kick the asses de los blanco and um, 
over two legs. So let's see if that's going to happen. But I didn't want to talk about that neither. Well, what did you want to talk about, Diego? Please, you know, put us out of our suspense. Well, my dear followers, my, uh, followers, my dear listeners, what I wanted to talk about was... Aliens, yes, aliens. And why did I want to talk about aliens? Well, because, first of all, I am super fascinated by the topic. I cannot get enough of the topic. Um, some people dismiss it as mere conspiracy theories. However, I think you're just still being ignorant if you are being so dismissive of this um, by branding it a conspiracy theory. 26 minutes of football, and we're going to have now about another 20 minutes of uh, a little bit more probably of alien talk and the reason being why is because it's a topic of interest of mine I hugely enjoy it I think it's more than just a conspiracy theory I think it's being proven that yes indeed UFOs with extraterrestrials manejandolos flying them around are within our cosmos within our universe within our solar system, within our planet, I would go so far to say. And I have, I think they've been doing that for, for many years, for centuries. Um, I think the evidence continues to stack up. Uh, also, mind you, for all those that are now bored or that don't want to listen to this topic, thank you for sticking around. We'll see you on the next Churros coming to you on Thursday or Friday for Patreons only. Mind you, I'm not going to be there, so I will see you next week. But for those that want to continue to listen... Thank you. And what I'm going to be playing for you is something that, in fact, a Churros community member, a valued one for that member, for that my, for that matter, a valued member for that matter, uh, sent to me. I'll not mention his name just to save his, uh, um, to keep his name private uh, out of respect for him. He is a uh, aerospace engineer, if I'm not mistaken, a, a pilot as well, a retired pilot. He often is so kind to share with me topics about whether it is the universe, the solar systems, you know, the entire cosmos, and uh, as well, just recently, this talk with a Dr. Gary Nolan on a channel called SALT. Now, SALT, to give you guys uh, a little bit of context here, is a global thought leadership and networking forum um, where they talk about anything from finances to uh, public policy, technology, etc., on this episode, I, I was unfamiliar with it, okay? On this um, episode that we're about to listen to, and I'll be reacting to it in, in real time. So uh, they've invited Dr. Gary Nolan to come on. He is a, a Stanford University uh, uh, professor. And um, I think, you know, let's just have a listen. I'm going to react to it in real time. It's uh, 18 minutes long. So I'll try to keep my uh, interjections short and sweet as uh, we listen to this talk between uh, Dr. Gary Nolan and another, the host called Alex Klukos, uh, Klukus, as uh, they discuss uh, the uh, extensive research that Dr. Nolan has done within the history uh, of UFOs and sightings and signs of extraterrestrial life including on this earth. I'm very excited to listen to it. According to Dr. Nolan, there's a, 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 an overwhelming amount of evidence where that, that shows, that proves that aliens have been here on our planet for a very long time. Uh, what technology is likely being used, the role of the U.S. government in uh, facilitating information as well. And, um, well, you know, Again, I'm excited to have a listen. I, I hope that this will come uh, across clearly. I always love listening to people like this, you know, that have all of the credibility uh, <laughs> behind them. Like, who are we to, 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 to be dismissive and to scuff it off as saying, ah, pfft, conspiracy theories. <laughs> Jeez. Whatever. Yeah, sure. And pigs fly. Uh, while, you know, these very studied 
reputable, high-ranked officials and people from all walks of life, or, or you know, that or, that, that, that come with just this overwhelming amount of evidence, whether it be eyewitness accounts or, in this case, the the research and study that this uh, Dr. Nolan has done. So I'm excited to listen. Again, thank you to this very valued Churros y Tacticas uh, community member, Patreon member as well, uh, a Patreon that has shared this with me, from me to you. Let's take a listen, enjoy. And for those that have uh, already signed off, we'll see you in the next Churros. Hello, everyone. Every year, I have the good fortune of um, bringing someone really special to SALT. Someone that is so it starts atypical, off with a little introduction, Alex, but very consequential. Focus. And today I'm very excited to welcome Dr. Gary Nolan with us. Thank you for coming. Hi, you. Today we are going to talk about aliens. Love it. And Gary, well, before we get into this topic, I figure it would be helpful to qualify yourself. Good. Because you are going to make some very bold statements here today. Dismiss and the I would skeptics. love for people Quick. to understand why they should believe you. And so perhaps, can you give a little bit of your background? Sure. Um, so I'm a professor in the Department of Pathology at Stanford. Uh, the primary research work in my lab is cancer immunology, virology. We also do a lot of work in bio threat. So we've worked with Ebola, Zika, uh, COVID um, when it was a big problem. Um, and uh, Primarily, the work in my lab is the development of instrumentation and algorithms to understand the complexity of the immune system in cancer. And in the process of doing that, we've created a, any of a number of technologies, which we spun out into companies. It's now nine companies. Two of them are on NASDAQ. Uh, and these immunology instruments are used pretty much around the world uh, in almost any advanced immunology uh, analysis and work. Fascinating, Understood. but what does it have to and do with alien? I'm curious. Right? Do you believe that extraterrestrial intelligence has visited planet Earth? I think you can go a step back. further. No it hasn't questions. just visited. It's been here a long time, and it's still here. Uh, and it has uh, uh, basically, um, you know, people talk about the wow signal, uh, looking for extraterrestrial intelligence. The wow signal is that people see it on an almost regular basis. That's the communication that's already here. And, and that statement seems so incredible that it, it's tough to believe. Right? Like people hear that, and Not so maybe a lot of people here hear that, and they don't believe it. And so I'm curious. Kian is a believe. If you had to assign a probability to that statement, that you believe extraterrestrial intelligence has visited, visited this planet, what probability would you assign? A hundred percent. And that's not just my opinion. I mean, look... Um, the National Defense Appropriation Act, passed last year, signed by, by Biden in uh, December. 30 pages of that is the establishment of an unidentified aerial phenomenon office, the establishment of looking into the harm that's happened to any of a number of the individuals, going back to 1945 and looking at the disinformation and misinformation that has been uh, basically articulated over the decades. 12 U.S. senators have signed on to a document that basically says we want the information. The establishment of an office, Arrow, in the Department of Defense, has 25 people working in it right now. And what's their, what's their goal? Collecting the information across all of the, uh, all of the U.S. Department of, of Intelligence, sorry, Department of Defense, intelligence offices, and collation of that into a uniform format for the very first time and provision of that then to Congress, the creation of a whistleblowers program specifically that allows people from, the, from within, who I'm going to say this, who've been working on the reverse engineering programs reverse engineering of objects, so that they can come in and break their oaths, but specifically just to talk to Congress and give that information in classified settings. And People that like the most Bob recent Lazar. one that happened was just last weekend, and it created quite a hornet's nest in Washington. And, and so let, let's just create kind of like a logical framework here. So we start at the top. We say now I mean, there's 100% probability that extraterrestrial intelligence has visited Earth. 
Now we have to go down to why that statement may be true, why you believe that statement is true. What, what is the evidence? And I think perhaps we all may have to read between the lines a little bit here. You may not maybe divulge everything, but in your opinion, what do you believe to be the most compelling evidence to support? I love it. I love it. Um, hearing things like that, I get goosebumps, you know, and I've been out of sheer, you know, self-interest. It's a hobby informing myself through documentaries, articles, famous New York Times article, uh, different ones that have come out over the time to, to kind of like, you know, educate myself on this topic, uh, you know, religiously watch as well. Anything that Jeremy Corbell puts out, obviously Joe Rogan over the years. And then hearing these like eyewitness accounts from high ranked, you know, pilots, army officials, and now somebody like this makes these kind of claims, these bold, bold statements, man. I'm like, why would they risk their neck, their entire reputations? Why would they put themselves out there like that if there wasn't a grain of truth? A little bit. And I'm not saying that all the sightings are real, but I just need one to be real in order to say, you see, there it is. Now what? <laughs> let's let's be, let's meet them. Let's meet. I want to like what is what are the next steps? I mean, so many questions will come to mind. You know, how long you guys been here? If they are, I mean, I can't wait. What he has to say. I, I hope that this is uh, interesting for the listeners. It certainly is for me. Like I said, I don't expect the vast majority of you to stick around. I don't even know if this will be able to be going up if it's not a copyright infringement of some sort on uh, on the different channels. But I'm going to continue. Maybe I won't do the whole, you know, we're four and a half minutes in. Uh, actually, I, I need to, I don't know if I'll be able to make the whole thing. But let's see. Let's see where this goes. I'm having a good time. Yeah, and I, but I do have to do something in about 10 minutes. So let's see. David. Well, I think the most compelling evidence is you just need to look at what your government is doing right now about it. I mean, just go look at the number of uh, politicians, and this is interesting, on both sides of the aisle who have come together and signed off on this statement. I mean, I was involved last year with putting together some of the wording of that, uh, of that, uh, the NDAA, which was passed into law. So, I mean, so what are they basing their opinions on? They're basing their opinions on the dozens of individuals who in one manner or another have come forward and talked to them in classified settings. So that's the first thing. Then my mm -hmm. personal that's experiences good. with the individuals who are, like who, well, the one person who actually was involved with collecting a lot of that original information, uh, and then my experience with people who, frankly, I know have worked or are working on the reverse engineering programs. Right. Okay, so let's, let's take one step back. Reverse engineering programs. Of downed craft. Now, the first question that people will ask is, well, if they're so frigging advanced, why are they, why are they crashing? Because what's crashing is not actual living things. I mean, if you, I, mean, I use this example a lot. If you wanted to study a tribe of cannibals in the middle of the Amazon, are you going to go yourself and show up in the middle of the, of the tribe and not hopefully become dinner on the other side of it? So if you're an advanced intelligence, you know, I don't think we're all that advanced, frankly. Um, you're not going to basically put your, your uh, life and limb at risk by coming here. So mostly what you're seeing here are either drones or some sort of advanced AI or whatever it is. I mean, look, we're, we're, already, we're already dealing with a, a, an alien intelligence in our own emails, right? Our own uh, you know, chat GPT, et cetera. We don't even know what it's doing. So imagine if you were a million years ahead of us. Uh, how do you how do you have a dialogue with something like that, or what is it that that could possibly do? Yeah, and I'm glad I'm glad that we've got some people here to witness these statements. I think they're very consequential. And so we it's start with now 100 percent probability of extraterrestrial in intelligence. We go to evidence. We now talk about down craft. We see the the, the government moving in a certain so direction. Classified. Presumably, the down craft is made of some material. Presumably, we could test that material. I know you've done a little bit of work firsthand. You yeah. have seen some material. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Right. Well, um, you know, so what is it that you hope to discover out of a material? 
So let's just go back, I mean, just briefly, uh, and, and why would you want to do it in the first place? So basically, a grain of silicon, you know, back in the 50s or 60s changed our entire culture and world, right? I mean, so something as small as that, the discovery of what you could accomplish with a little piece of germanium uh, doped with the right uh, elements changed our understanding. Now, so we have multiple simultaneous sensor systems that have seen these objects go from 50 feet above the water to up to 14 miles mm -hmm. and then back in less than a second, all right? I mean, that's just a truth. Yeah. The, U.S. We government has confirmed that these kinds nine. of measurements are done. Now, right. they're very careful what they say. They say, well, we have no evidence of E.T. Well, because, you know, no E.T. is going to come walking in here and say, hello. I, I kind of right? wanted that. But um, if you read the lines that, on the Gary. flip side of it, it does stuff that we can't do. We know that the Russians and the Chinese are not doing and so if you can go from zero to 5,000 miles an hour and take a, a right turn and not end up squished like a bug on the windscreen on the other side, if they have windscreens, uh, then uh, what is the physics that accomplishes that? So what that tells you is that we need to rethink our physics, first of all, to say that, well, you know, we saw birds fly, so it took us 3,000 years and we figured out how to fly. But now we see these things doing this, so what is it that that lets us do? So I know some of the physicists on the inside who work at some of these big defense corporations who basically said, oh, well, here's how you tweak even general relativity to accomplish that. But then you say, well, how much energy is needed to do it? Well, more than the whole exactly. nuclear output of the planet yeah. per day, per movement. So you start to backtrack and you say, okay, well, who could do that? Well, we can't. No. Will we be able to do it in a thousand years? But if we had a piece of any of this, let's say it's a thousand uh, uh, revolutions ahead of us, or a million revolutions ahead of us, even a tiny piece of knowledge from that could revolutionize what it is that we're doing. Yeah, sure. I'm always... I'm a, I'm always looking for the opportunity. I look at the at the upside of this. I'm not worried about them coming and, you know, raiding us or yeah. taking our women and children. Uh, that's not my concern. My concern is how do we use it? Yeah, yeah. And 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 I'm curious. Do you have confidence that you us Just give it to me. will have material, literal physical material to evaluate to analyze? Yes, 100. percent 100% again. Okay. It's, there. It's, there. it's there. It's there. I mean, I can say this. I, I was working with a group about seven, eight years ago, and I literally got within a few weeks of gaining access to one of the, um, one of the objects. And wow. when the people who didn't want us to gain access to it found out about it, they pulled some bureaucratic administrative tricks and snatched it away. Wow. wow. And then so, so now we have you, Dr. Nolan, making this bold you statement. You are well positioned to make this Call statement. Now maybe we get into like some fun. Let's like feel comfortable so hypothesizing a little bit peoples. as to what is happening. Like what what is it? Right? Like and nobody's gonna hold you to this, right? Now maybe we go down from one hundred percent probability to now we're speculating. Right. Okay? Now let's speculate together. What what do you think it is? Right. So to to do that, I'll start with kind I can't, of a mantra I I've had for the last pretty soon. I'll give it another while. couple of minutes, but so, we're definitely you know, not going to get through the individual experiences of what people we're see is an anecdote, but an anecdote doesn't convince a scientist. What's it convinces a, what is it that convinces a scientist? Data. Right? What doesn't convince scientists? A conclusion. So really mm -hmm. the objective here and what has allowed me to actually like talk that. to some of my scientist colleagues who first said, Gary, you're going to ruin your career. Well, okay, whatever. It's too late for that. Um, but I haven't. Uh, and Applause um, for Gary. People because like I Gary. basically say, look, if you and I can agree that the data is real, irrespective of what the potential conclusions might be, the hypotheses, yeah. then the onus is no longer on me to come up with an answer. Now it's also on you because we're having a discussion about this. So it's Believe the data, not the conclusion. Yeah. So you see the data, and that's, when, and that's where the fun is. And that's where the hypothesis starts. Right. So, you know, people have come up with all kinds of ideas, everything from future humans, future yeah. AI coming back to us because somehow they figured out time travel, mm -hmm. to what's called the ultra-terrestrial hypothesis that they are part of. And I'm sure some people here at least know what a von Neumann probe is, right? No. This idea of a self-replicating machine that could have been developed by a technology or a civilization on the other side of the galaxy that even in just a few hundred million years would, could make its way by conventional means all the way across, mm -hmm. the, uh, all the, way across mm -hmm. the galaxy. Mm -hmm. And when it gets there, it basically builds copies of itself and it does what it's doing and it basically some other civilization sent it out. Now, 
Avi Loeb was here last year. So uh, I'm part of a, an SAB with Avi Loeb uh, on a company called Copernicus Space Corporation. Yo, SAB, and guess what? You. Our objective is to build SAB, the first von Neumann probes to go out and spread humanity's original presence across all yeah. of reality. So that's one of I the volunteer. Yeah. A third I'm one a is what do you the dare, human Dr. Grace. Owen? You have to speculate. What do you right. think it is? Let's be bold. I think it is an advanced form of intelligence. Here we go something that we don't understand, that is using some kind of intermediaries, however it is, like I said about the, you know, the, you don't, you're not going to end up in the middle of the tribe, the angry monkeys that are flinging muck at each other, or That's nuclear nice. bombs, uh, you're, not gonna end, you're not going to show yourself in the middle of the ambulance, you're going to send intermediaries. You know, it's not that they walk amongst us that, you know, you, uh, or, you know, wearing a skin suit, or actually the alien, Right. No, it. you're going to basically put something there that is, I think of it as an intelligence test. Can you see what's in front of you for what it really is? Yeah. Can you see the anomalous data point that is there that you realize what it is? I mean, when the uh, S South American um, native tribes first saw the mm. um, Spanish ships coming across the horizon, mm. they didn't realize what it was. They couldn't see it for what it was. So, you know, this is, as I said before, this is the kind of the wow factor yeah. that they're, well, they're showing up. They're saying, well, you know, they're who amongst you are intelligent enough to realize what it is that you're looking at? Yeah. They don't have to land don't on the White House lawn. We can only make the joke yeah. about is there intelligence in D.C. at all, yeah. right? You, you just need to show yourself to enough to acculturate. Yeah. Now, if you've been around for a long time, and this is what, something that I do think has been around, they've been around for a long time, they are affecting our culture. Right. It's actually often thought that many of the religions that we think of as the most important have been part of this process. Hmm. I mean, there are so many well, tangents to go down. We uh, have about one minute. And four the uh, oh, we actually only just four minutes left. I, I do have to bounce. I got to run. Um, this is fascinating, though. I'm going to give uh, I'm going to leave these last four minutes to myself. 715. I got to get on another call. So um I hope this was enjoyable. Uh, definitely just reinforces my belief that we are not alone. They are here with us. We were never part. We always in my heart. All right. Um, and I want to thank the Churros, uh, Value Churros member. Again, I'll leave him uh, anonymous or her. And uh, But thank you for sending me this link. Keep sending that stuff, the articles, everything uh, that you get your hands on. I am fascinated by this. In fact, I will, I'll even say this much. Oh, I said it on Churros. UFO Hunter. UFO Hunter. My series <laughs> coming to you soon. Hopefully. Truly hope so. Uh, who knows? Maybe in the future, huh? Maybe you'll see me one day on the History Channel. You have a wonder with Diego Logan. Uh, I would love it, man. It would be another dream come true. Not going to lie. Thank you guys for churros, for tuning in. Hope you guys enjoyed this, uh, once again, solo sesh. Uh, a little bit different, you know, with the, with the D-Spot flavor. You know how I like to do it. And... Um, Thank you for all of you that stuck it here until the end, stuck it through. Make sure that you stay tuned for tomorrow because Churros will continue tomorrow with Kian Sobani. He will record from uh, his uh, interim home, let's call it. And uh, he might bring on a guest, he said. So I'm going to put forward these talking points. I, I'm going to assume he's not going gonna to step around the alien topic and uh, just be dismissive of it. Call it a conspiracy, but he knows one day an alien will knock on his door. Um, that's it. And he'll say, It was all a simulation. It was all a simulation. Or the success of what am I do? We orchestrated it all. We do. It was our lives. <laughs> and we'll go full circle. And my conspiracy theories will have been proven correct. All right. That's it for me. I'm going to sign out. Thank you all. Make sure you give us a follow. Spread this to your friends. Have a wonderful week. And we'll talk very soon. Peace out.